So in terms of things that I'm going to be covering in the seminar, I'm going to first chat about things that you should be thinking about in prep when you are on back half, because I think a lot of success when extending comes from how you brainstorm in prep, then how to adapt in the round when extending, drills to get better at extension speeches, how to avoid common mistakes when extending, and then get into the different kinds of, of extension speeches, not simply analysis and impact extensions, but go more into things like when your extension is primarily focused on rebuttal and how to break deadlocks as well. So starting with the first thing about things that you should be thinking about in prep when you are on back half. So I think that the first and the trivial thing here is just that you need to be thinking about as much content as possible, given that it's likely that your opening half is probably going to take the arguments that are the most obvious or appear to be the strongest for, for the motion. So given that you don't have to refine your arguments in as much detail when you're on back half, because you can do that in the round as well, you have slightly you have the advantage of being able to spend more time on the brainstorming phase rather than on the argument refining phase. And you should really be taking advantage of that to think um, more nichely. So ways that you can do this are different stakeholder analysis try and find hidden principles. Think about impacts are going to be slightly more long-term so that you can enlarge the quantity of matter that you're able to choose from in the round and that you have more options if front half starts to take your material. Um, I think that secondly here, it's important that you should deprioritize material that you think opening half is probably going to run when there's a high likelihood of that. So I think that often you will know the team who's in front half, but more importantly, um, you've just seen the motion before and you think that there's a couple arguments that are quite obvious and that the average debater is going to think of first. It's probably a safe bet to say that the first argument or two that you think of in prep, maybe with the exception of round one where levels will be more varied, those arguments are probably going to be taken by top half. So what you should be trying to do is, even if you can have a list on your page of all of the arguments that you think of, in terms of when you reach chat with your partner, um, in terms of developing those arguments, you should probably be allocating more time to developing the newer material, or the material that's more difficult to develop, because it's kind of a waste of time. If you end up fleshing out arguments, you're not eventually going to use in the debate. I think importantly, let's say that you're in prep and you can only think of one or two strong arguments. I think in these cases, when you're fleshing out these ideas, even when you have an inkling that your front half is just going to run those same arguments, you should be trying to find unique ways to flush out and to develop those ideas. So that is, even if front half is going to say this argument, is there a unique level of framing that I can provide that would be able to beat top half if I have to run that argument? What is a likely mechanism or, or illustration that's re really going to be crucial in allowing that argument to stick that front half is more likely to miss? I think that you should a good way to do this is to think about the most likely ways that a good op team or that a good team on the other side of the bench is going to attack the argument that front half is likely to run, which can start kind of a questioning phase of what are likely, what are the vulnerabilities in the argument likely to be in terms of how could the other top half team win that clash that you could step in and then fill the gap in the argument? Or what is the mechanism that top half is likely to say? Why is that something that could be imperfect? And what are unique ways that I can extend on the argument to make it more persuasive for the judge overall? So in a nutshell, try and think of different stuff from top half. If you think of the same material, be creative in the portions of the argument that you prioritize actually developing in prep. I think that finally in prep, um, you should not only be thinking about a lot of material that you can extend off of, but when you think of new arguments, especially if your strength in prep is a quantity of arguments, but you struggle with framing, you should also be thinking about ways that you can frame your extension to beat top half, because in order to win on back half, you cannot just have a new impact that sticks. You also have to persuade the panel that the impact is more important than what you are, than what front half ultimately said. So, Therefore, in terms of framing, a good way to do this is to predict what top half is likely to run in prep, and then think about ways you can frame the material that you're running as being more important than that, and ways you can try and minimize the, the relevance of an actor that is being discussed on top half. I think this is really important because it's not super intuitive to always think of ways to frame your extension in the debate, um, especially when you're also trying to track front half teams to rebut them. So it's good to also have a head start in prep to think about ways to strategically frame your extension, um, particularly if your argument appears to be off clash and it appears to not be as impactful. So if you're running kind of a front half team talking about more extreme impacts, if you're running an extension like this makes people happier, you should automatically be thinking about why making people happier is a more important clash than whatever the top half teams are discussing. Um, so that's kind of it for what you should think about in prep. I think that over time, you'll just get better at being able to think of more content and then that will automatically be an advantage when extending in terms of what to prioritize. So the next thing that I want to chat about is important things, just be cognizant of when you're in the round, when you're adapting, and before you ultimately give your extension speech. 
So the first thing to flag here is that it's very important to be adaptable in the debate. So what you thought you were going to run in prep can be extremely different from how the debate ultimately goes. I think that one way that this often happens is that you actually think of really niche and creative extensions when you're in prep, because you think that top half is going to take the obvious stuff, but then top half doesn't take the obvious stuff. Even if your extension would have been like genius had top half said whatever they did strategically, it's often just good to like rethink. Um, top half didn't take this argument. It's a far clearer path to victory more panels are going to give me the win to readapt and then to quickly develop the material that you do not develop in prep. I think that while it's often scary to like flesh out an entirely new argument in a deputy speech before you extend, it's often worth it, especially if the arguments are more intuitive. You've seen them run before, you know how to develop them. And I think that sometimes having a strategic extension can be more important than finessing it perfectly, where every single like wink of the argument is kind of fleshed out absolutely perfectly. Um, in terms of being adaptable, just another thing to um, think about here is like, if top half burns the extension that you really, really wanted to say, even if you thought it was a fantastic extension, like don't get too emotionally connected to it and run it anyways. Um, always just think about how to kind of change what you're doing. Secondly, in the round, I think that when extending, active listening is a skill that is not chatted about enough and that is extremely, extremely important. And I think in the trade-off between active listening and note-taking, active listening can often be more important. I think particularly here, listening to deputy speeches when you're in extension is really, really important. Um, number one, if you see that deadlocks are being broken by deputies and how damaging that ref is, that can impact how you're going to extend. So often you'll frame your extension as being a deadlock breaking extension, but if deputy has already covered a lot of that material, that's something that's gonna become a lot more difficult. It's also good to see the rebuttal that the deputy is giving. So if you're in a situation where you're panicking, but the deputy did a bad job in beating a particular argument, you can try and advance your ranking by just making sure that you have thorough refutation to a, to a particular point. And if deputy absolutely crushes an argument, it's bad to prioritize um, refutation to the argument that the deputy clearly be on that particular issue. Um, I think it's also important to listen to deputies because a lot of deputies are very sneaky and what they will do is they'll burn a lot of new content in their speech. So if you're on CO after LO, you're like fantastic, I have four different ways to extend. And then the deputy, especially the other top half team is weaker, will often just try and run a bunch of new material, which is like a strategy that happens a lot. I think it's important to listen to this um, because number one, if they burn your argument, you either need to adapt how you make that argument. So you can still probably run the same extension given that deputies will often spread themselves quite thin in the way that they try and burn material but it's important to be cognizant of how opening half set that argument so that you can tell the judge, look, I know that the deputy speaker spent five minutes on this claim. They never fully developed it. Here are the new impacts that you need for this argument to actually stick. I think that also, if the deputy runs new content, but it's not directly related to how you were planning on extending, it's also good to be aware of that because you might need to outframe it. So you're no longer in a framing battle with just the first two speakers, but if the deputy were in a really persuasive argument, either you or the whip speaker will also need to explain where your contribution is more important than the material that came up in the other deputy speeches. So I think that listening, being adaptable are the main things here. If you're bad at tracking front half debates, which is something that I've struggled with, and you struggle to multitask between listening to a deputy speaker, um, but also to write your own extension, I think that a useful thing here is to also ask your partner to help you track the deputy speech. So like have your Facebook chat or whatever means you use to communicate open and say, if, de if the deputy speaker either covers my extension or, or says something that's really impactful, please let me know so that I can adapt my argumentation. So the next thing that I wanna cover is drills to get better at extending. So something that I've found helpful is that I think a lot of the time when we're trying to get better at like OGs, we will just do a prep with our partner and then someone will say the PM or we will just practice those preps. I think it's really important to do back half preps as well, even if you don't have a full round. So you do the prep going in, thinking that you will be a back half team, um, and then you can prep differently. So this is an advantage and it will help with back half because A, it gets you in the mindset of thinking of new niche and creative content rather than always just going for the one or two obvious things, which will in the long term just help you become a more creative thinker on back half. But I also think that it's really helpful in getting practice at predicting front half debates quite quickly. So it, it's a really, really useful skill on back half to know how the vast majority of top halves are going to unfold so you can understand how your extension is going to strategically fit in. Um, and I think that when you do a lot of these drills, you can predict top halves more quickly, which is just a huge advantage when you are on back half. 
Um, I think also you can do extension drills when watching videos. So I so what you can do is you can check the tab at a tournament, especially in outruns that were filmed and see when backup teams go through or when backup teams placed highly and got high speaker scores. What you can do here is you can prep as if you were going to be the extension speaker, watch front half, deliver the extension, and then you can see how the, how the extension that you gave lined up to what the winning extension in a round was. Obviously, there can be multiple ways to win on back half. So like you, you could have given a fantastic extension that could be entirely different from the other fantastic extension that was sufficient in winning the debate in a particular room. But especially in cases if you're watching out rounds and the speakers are stronger and you were like, crap, I'm derivative, I didn't know what to say. It's really useful to be able to see how another speaker either used framing in that room that was able to beat top half um, and just how they were able to position their extension overall and the material that they thought of. Another thing which I think goes without saying is just you can ask like, if you had difficulty on backup in a particular round, just ask your judge, how could I have extended? Um, and ask them for feedback on your extension and if they had any other ideas or just talk to other teams at the comp about what happened on their backup rooms, which is just like a very, very good way via debate osmosis to just get better at extensions and to get more ideas about what to see on backup. Okay, cool. So next to talk about common mistakes that often happen with extending. So number one, which happens all the time, is just weighing on the basis of a group being more vulnerable without actually explaining why that group is more important. But like I think more harmful with these extensions that the underlying argument is the exact same as what Top Half said. You're just identifying that a more vulnerable group is impacted as well. So this happens a lot in social justice debates where you're like in a feminism round, for example, you're like, oh, poor women are also impacted by this, but you're just using the same analysis that Top Half said. And then you're like, this additional group is harmed as well. This isn't to say that on back half, you can never make an extension by talking about a more vulnerable actor but when you do that it's often valuable if you explain a just because someone's a minority why are they necessarily more important but further than that not just using the same analysis that top half gave if there are distinct ways that a group is going to be harmed actually explain those distinct ways analytically rather than just relying on analysis that top half already gave um, I think that secondly, running a developing world extension or an extension with different context without explaining why that new context is more important, but similarly to the vulnerable actors extensions are just to use the same arguments that front half said, reposition them in the developing world and are like, oh, all of the impacts are here, but they're larger because these countries are even less economically privileged. Once again, developing world extensions can often be particularly effective in the sense that it can apply to a, like a higher number of countries or you can frame the impacts as being more significant, but the underlying analysis that you were giving to make a claim should be different to what top half is saying. And you should also be giving framing as to why this context actually matters or doing some like meaningful legwork to explain why you're not just relying on what top half said, but you're actually providing new reasons as to why a particular region is going to be harmed. Um, another common mistake is very, very lazy framing. So the most common ways that this happens and I'm particularly guilty of is just calling top half a deadlock when it's not, right? Like very, very, like there's, if not in that many circumstances where top half is going to be entirely a wash, even if both teams advance arguments on a particular issue about whether voters will be more likely to act in a particular way, there is often one team that did a better job of explaining why their impact is true or of weighing it into the round. And I think that a lot of good judges are aware um, or like will be able to see that top half is not actually a deadlock. So rather than just using the stock phrase top half was a deadlock, it's often better to use other framing mechanisms to explain why you actually beat top half. So I think that it's better to be accurate and maybe say that one team won a front half clash marginally. So even though OG explained why voters are more important in this regard and they won that clash, given that the other opening team also had a, a offensive material on a particular issue, it's not a slam dunk and therefore the material should be weighed as being less important. But aside from just the deadlock framing, just use other mechanisms to holistically explain why a clash is less important in terms of the severity of an impact of that clash, the number of people that that clash applies to. Um, I think that a final thing about a very common mistake is just running new material without explaining how that material is strategically positioned in the round whatsoever. In some cases, the extension can just dump everything and then the whip can be the one who engages in framing. But often it's good for the judge to kind of see where your extension is going strategically before you get to the whip speaker in the sense that a lot of judges are just highly skeptical of extension speeches and they're like, like top half clash is implicitly more important and they're looking for reasons to dismiss it and won't really understand it strategically. But also if the whip has a lot of work to do in responsiveness, especially in rooms that are tight and competitive, they can't just spend their entire speech out framing top half. They also, they also have to do work to actually engage in direct responsiveness to the other back half team or to a top half team. So it's good for the judge to have a strategic interaction of the argumentation during the extension speech, especially because judging often happens based on first impressions. 
And ways that you can do this are just like at the beginning of your speech, you can have framing about the problems with top half. Before you run the argument, you can have framing about why it's the most important clash. Or at the end of your speech, you can explain why it's the most important material in the round. The order that the framing happens is not as important as it just being present in the speech in the first place, which is of course round dependent but is advantageous in the vast majority of rooms. So I think an example about where framing rather than just making a really important argument on front half would be beneficial is in the motion, this house prefers a world where radical honesty is the norm which I think is that one of the first docks bridge. So let's say that front half had a lot of clash about the principled and inherent value of truth and why that's necessary for autonomy. We have material about how power dynamics under the status quo impacts who is able to be honest. And there's a clash about emotions and how people feel when they are dishonest or when people are confronted with dishonesty that might hurt them versus emotional harms of people bottling up their feelings. So there's just a lot of stakeholders that are involved in this motion. Let's say that you're a CG and you wanna run an argument about relationships and how they are better in a world where people are a lot more honest. I think that the part of this extension that's actually easier is just proving why relationships might be better when there's more honesty in terms of how this promotes earlier conflict resolution that will prevent things from boiling up. But the difficult part of this extension is given that front half ran a robustly developed principle and explained why various social groups are gonna be better off, you need to do a lot of legwork to actually explain why relationships matter the most in the context of the round. So one way that you could do this is just by Saying, like most people in their lives at some juncture are going to be in, in a relationship and therefore the impacts are a lot more niche. Um, you can frame the principles like folding back into something utilitarian, but you need something to be able to strategically position what you're saying and the wit probably won't have enough time to do that perfectly in their own speech. Cool. So the next thing that I want to talk about are tips for different kinds of extensions and how to do those more effectively. So I'm not just going to subdivide this into analysis versus impact extensions. I'm going to go into greater depth into a few different types of extensions. So firstly, when you are adding mechanisms. Secondly, when you're adding impacts. Thirdly, when you are running a new argument. Um, fourthly, when you are running rebuttal as your primary extension. And then finally, what I'm going to call strategy extensions. So when your extension is mostly built around weighing or burden pushes and things like that. What I will caveat here that I probably should have mentioned at the beginning of the seminar is that Tex also gave a brilliant seminar about extensions on this platform as well, which is called Buying or Selling Your Extension. And I'm purposefully not including some of the pointers that he gave in that seminar in case people have watched that. But I highly recommend checking that out after this as a compliment to this seminar as well. Okay, so in terms of different kinds of extensions, so what I'm going to start off with are mechanistic extensions, which are giving an additional reason about why an argument is true, even if that argument was already present within top half. In terms of when to do this kind of extension, um, a great like a good time to do it is when top half did a bad job of mechanizing a claim, which is the like obvious one. Um, note that if top half provided the tagline of an argument or tagline of a reason why something is true, you can often still do a mechanistic extension, even if they appear to have a lot of reasons for something. So often if a team has like five reasons for a particular argument, I'm adding myself there, they won't actually explain like in sufficient depth why all those reasons are true. And the argument can actually still be built up on a flimsy premise. So provided that you explain why those premises are flimsy or if they just are, and like the judge will be able to, to identify that, you can very clearly like say, front half may have tagged X being a reason for something, never actually explain how that works in the real world and that you can just help ground the mechanization substantially more by providing a lot more illustrations about why a particular claim is true. I think another good time to run a mechanistic extension is that if you truly think that the most you can take in a round is, is a second, or if you're strategically going for a second in the context of an, of an out round. So there's certain motions that just aren't as deep, even though they are set, or there's like one argument that's winning for each side. And these kinds of debates, you often won't be able to extend by just adding new material. We need to find a way to create greater depth in arguments that, that, that were already run. Um, if you're going for a second, even if you think that top half gave a persuasive reason why an argument was true already, but providing an additional persuasive reason, you can just frame yourself as strengthening the argument sufficiently um, such that you can take a second by just giving an additional reason about why that very persuasive argument is true. In terms of how to run mechanistic extensions effectively, um, copying text advice here, don't overstate the, new, the newness of the extension, which will just seem intellectually disingenuous and the judge will be more likely to dismiss that on the basis of, but like clearly top half already gave that same reason. So just be very honest about the nuance that you're adding to a particular claim. Um, another good piece of advice that text gave here was just to use good language, um, or sorry, to use new language in the way that you explain a mechanism. So top half, 
gave a mechanism about competition. Unifree mechanism is relies on a similar chain of logic, just vary your language such that according to judge psychology, it is going to seem more new. Another way to run these extensions effectively is that it's good to provide some framing about why the mechs provided by top half were insufficient. So a useful way to often do this is that the other top half team is going to have refutation to the mechanisms that were given to your opening bench. And you can pinpoint that refutation and be like, this mechanism was taken down by the other opening half team persuasively. And even if it's not taken down by the other top half team, you can probably just find ways to like sneakily undermine the persuasiveness of those mechanisms without direct rebuttal by saying things like that could be a reason for why the argument is true in this particular country. Our mechanisms are going to be more widely applicable to how a policy is likely to unfold in a broader number of of different circumstances. So always, even if you're not providing a new argument, it's still important to use framing to explain why your, mechan why your mechanistic contribution is something that is important. So as an example of a MEC extension, um, for most of my examples for the, for the remaining portion of the seminar, I'll be using docked world motions just because the, the debates are fresher um, in my head. So the motion was, this house believes that social movements should emphasize an individual's capacity to change their circumstances in the face of oppression, as opposed to emphasizing the structures that restrict and determine an individual's fate. I'll just send the motions in the chat, because I know I talk quite quickly. Um, by the way, if at any point I need to slow down, also just let me know in the chat as well. So let's say that you are closing government and opening government makes the following two arguments. Their first argument is that and the, the main frame of the OG case is that what we need to change here are individual actions. And if you tell, and people are, are going to be a lot more willing to work hard, and they believe that they can actually change their circumstances and they feel a lot more hopeful about actually getting a form of social change. So that's how they mechanized their individual action argument. It was about hope. Um, they also ran an argument about how social movements are perceived um, just better by the majority of the population when they appear to be less lazy and actually encouraging their own people to work hard. So I think that these are probably like, even though the analysis under these claims is not the best way to make those two arguments, these are just the two broad ideas that are in the government cases and you're on CG and you're like, what do I do? So I think that one way that you could run a useful mechanistic ex extension here is to provide an additional reason about why you get individual success that is not contingent on people working harder. So if, so Top half said, or OG said, people are going to work harder. Um, I think that in a lot of rooms, OO probably sufficiently mitigated that argument by saying that people are probably going to have incentives to work hard under either side of the house and just give reasons about why you need to be able to work hard within capitalistic structures to make money for your family. Um, just why you still have other broad incentives to do that. So another way that you can make the argument about more individual success is to prove why movements that emphasize an individual's capacity to change your circumstances a lot more, spend a lot more time internally discussing ways that individuals can advance their position and ways to kind of better yourself that will give people more equipped or, or help equip people with skills to actually be able to accomplish that. So for example, if feminism spends more time talking about your individual capacity to change their circumstances rather than only blaming structural forces, you might spend a greater quantity of time talking about things like how to be assertive in pay negotiations such that people are actually more cognizant of these the kind of skills that they need to advance your own circumstances. So why the movement about, so why the mechanism about internal movement discussions? Well, like definitely, and analytically vulnerable is a good example of a strategic mechanism is that it's not reliant on the front half premise of people will now work harder that was taken down by OO, but it's you, you can position yourself into the round that even if people work as hard, it's just about how the movement engages in discussions about how you ought work in a way that can give people skills to increase the probability of their own success. So the next kind of extension that I want to talk about are extensions via adding an impact, which is using the mechanization that top half provided to prove a particular claim, but you're adding a new reason about why that mechanization or why the end premise that they prove from that mechanization is something that is impactful. When to do it, which is just quite trivial, is just if the top half team did a very good job of proving everything, but they either don't include all of the impacts about why that argument should matter, and they just do a poor job of explaining their mechanisms into the relevance of the round um, holistically and overall. In terms of how to do impact-based extensions well, so judges will often dismiss an impact-based extension on the basis of, oh, like you added a new really cool impact, but it was still premised on top half-based material. So we just credit them from doing all of the legwork in your argument. Um, I think that a useful way to overcome this problem in panel discussions and to increase the likelihood that your impacts are actually going to be credited is to still provide a new reason as to why the argument is true. So even if top half had the best mechanisms and you're not gonna win on the basis of providing an additional reason, 
if, if you can find like some kind of way to prove why your material is not entirely contingent on top of mechanization, it can allow someone on the panel to be like, look, like they also give a new reason for why their claim is true. Therefore, we can credit their impacts to a broader extent. So that's just like a safeguard. It's often just good to provide an additional mechanism as well, even when the, the primary strategic weight of your extension is because of impacting rather than because of mechanization. Um, another way to do these extensions well um, is to explain why the impacting that you're doing is needed to change the debate in some way that is meaningful. So just frame it as top half proved X. I'm unclear why X matters in the round whatsoever if they never explain why X matters more than things that the other bench was discussing, we're gonna actually fulfill this gap by giving the impacts that are needed to weigh the material that Top Half gave overall. So, I mean, the common thread here of all different types of extensions is just framing your contribution in a way that's strategic and in a way that is persuasive. So an example of an impact-based extension, um, I'm not gonna copy and paste the info slide, but it was the China motion from the Western division. This, the specific details about what the models are are not super important. Um, as much as like the, the example that I'm going to provide. So let's say that you are CEO and OO makes an argument um, that when you have more privatization, because a portion of the debate was, do we prefer SOEs or do we prefer private companies operating? They argue that private companies is good because you get more competition between different businesses rather than state-run mon monopolies that tend to be a lot more inefficient. And, and the way that they just impacted why competition is good is that businesses are less lazy, they make better decisions. That's good for economic efficiency overall. On CO, something that you can say with that same mechanism, but an entirely different impact, is saying that more competition between businesses can also be a better model for innovation. So just like explaining why a model of having multiple companies competing will likely produce more new stuff than just having one company that might have that might be slightly more well resourced, but doesn't have the same economic necessity to be able to beat their rivals. And you can explain that innovation is substantially more important because China is currently in a technology war with the West and the first country who's going to produce something will have massive first mover advantage in the way that they integrate their technology and then spreading that technology to multiple different countries. So while the, so while the mechanism for competition is the same, you are entirely repositioning that impact from just you get slightly more GDP growth to innovate more that will provide advantages when it comes to like global economics. Um, note that as I said earlier, it's good to provide a new reason for this. So if the end impact that you're going for is about Western Chinese competition for in the international technology market, you can also just add a mechanism of it's more likely that other countries will accept Chinese parts when they're not affiliated with SOEs, because from a political standpoint, it's easier to justify accepting companies that are removed from the Chinese Communist Party to a broader extent. So private, just like to in order to buffer against the judges being like your mechanism was the exact same this can help because you're providing an additional reason as to why your material was not contingent on analysis that top half already provided so when you run an extension like this make sure to explain why gdp growth domestically within china is less important than even a small probability of being able to tap into international technology markets first so the next kind of extension is the classic extension of just you are running a new argument for just grabbing iced coffee, which is um, just like an idea that is different from the broad things that Top Half already spoke about. In terms of how to run a new argument well, so something to be mindful of is that when you are picking an argument, it is good to plausibility test whether this extension can actually be feasible um, before you run it and to critically assess that. So there is a reason Top Half didn't run the argument. It's probably a more difficult claim to prove, even if it's an argument that is very, very, very impactful it is good to actually ask yourself within 14 minutes that my partner and I have, can I reasonably prove this claim? And often it's very tempting to go for the claim of like, ah, oh, we increase the probability of civil war, but there's a massive trade-off between the likelihood that the judge will actually buy that claim. So just interrogate the argument in prep with your partner to see if it's actually a feasible claim to run. Um, a second thing to note about running new argument extensions is that you need to do two things for these extensions to actually stick. Number one, prove the claim. Number two, to prove that it's a more important claim than top half. So similarly, that if you can't prove the argument in 14 minutes, if you can't think of a feasible way to frame the, the clash is actually mattering in the debate whatsoever, it's also probably not a super helpful argument with the exception of you don't think that there's any other way. Like, you know that you're not gonna take a first or a second under either side of the house. So you're just kind of, if you're trying to take a third or, or a fourth, um, the consideration of it's difficult to frame against top half can become less important. 
which will just depend on the dynamics of the RAND that you are in. So an example of how to run a new argument and to frame it well is from the Docsbridge three quarters motion, which I'll paste in the chat, um, which is this house believes feminists and Muslim majority countries should, should advocate for the abolishment of Sharia courts rather than working to reform it. So our opening government in this round did a very good job of explaining why Sharia law is something that can be oppressive even when it's integrated and therefore practically and principally the feminist movement should still oppose it, even if there's a higher likelihood of success. And then they also gave reasons about why there's a higher likelihood that you will get change within these countries when you're advocating for abolition using mechanization like the like the Overton window. Um, so it will help moderate movements seem better and over time you will, normal, you will normalize more extreme ideas to a broader extent. And they also spoke a little bit about younger people within these countries or secular people who are gonna be more likely to get on board to actually create this kind of change. So they really did take a lot of the obvious stuff. So what we do in closing government um, is that our argument was just about why this is just good for feminist movements of these countries, irrespective of your ability to actually get forms of change. So we explained why under either side of the house, there are massive, massive barriers for women to actually get any kind of reform within these court systems, just due to the fact that they are often like these movements are numerically small, they are highly stigmatized, they often lack access to sufficient resources, and there are clear religious reasons to resist forms of changing systems of religious law under either side of a house. And therefore, even if one top half team proved a higher likelihood of, of reform or reform being marginally better, that's contingent on actually getting reform in the first place, that's unlikely. Therefore, the only thing that actually matters in this debate is how does this impact feminist movement within these countries and the way that their movement is ultimately framed. So our, our main claim here is that you're you're going to be better able to get Western support and help for the movement if you frame yourself as being in opposition to radical Sharia or Islamic ideals that the West tends to hate. And then impacted by Western support is really important. And also about how there's often changing demographics within feminist movements where younger people are becoming increasingly secular. And we gave structural reasons for that. And then we explained why important demographics are going to be more willing to buy in when you adopt narrative that's not as religious in nature and that appears to be less religiously and appears to be less religiously extreme. So in this case, it's not only about running a new argument because intuitively, like ways that a feminist movement is perceived by the West or by people within that country seems to be less important than changing entire court systems, but it's also about providing the framing to marginalize top half impacts and actually explain why arguments that top half made are not as impactful. Cool, so the next kind of extension that I wanna talk about are running rebuttal as your primary contribution. Um, in rebuttal-based extensions, it's highly possible that you also have something that's new, but your new stuff is probably not the most persuasive, and that alone is not going to allow you to beat top half. And the main thing that you are going for it to rank well with the panel is to run rebuttal, which is a strategy that can be very effective. In terms of when to do it, so there was a question that was asked before the seminar of what do you do if front half basically sets everything and you're absolutely stumped? I think that running a, like a rebuttal-based extension can be a very useful way to improve your ranking in the round. Um, I also think that like these should only be conceptualized as a very defensive type extension, but they can also be quite offensive if top half said the good arguments, but they still lose to the other cross bench based on responsiveness issues. And when beating a portion of an argument that the other top half team made or that the team on your diagonal made is necessary to strategically change the round whatsoever. So there's a very, very clear impact of maybe one team was arguing that like you will get a war if X policy takes place. And you know that if a team actually proves that very, very high magnitude impact, they're probably going to win the debate and it's going to be difficult to beat them. So you need to take down that premise and extension if you want a viable shot of winning. In terms of how to do these extensions well, something that I just want to caveat here is that a lot of the time when teams run positive matter, it's actually still kind of rebuttal. So if you don't want to frame your extension as being rebuttal based, even if you got the inspiration for your extension via rebuttal, you can just call it a new argument. But like, you're, like the thing that you're doing here is still primarily rebuttal. So like in tech rounds, for example, um, you, you, you might be on back half running material about why regulation of tech is possible or is more likely, which you are using to refute a claim that tech innovation is going to be done in a very unaccountable way. Even though what you're doing here is like primarily rebutting the fact that tech innovation is going to be done poorly, you can frame it as being new material, which is often good if judges are just hesitant to be like, rebuttal extensions did some damage, they mitigated the other team, but they're not enough to rank you highly. So you can kind of frame your contributions in a way that is sneaky, regardless of what actually inspired the idea for the extension in the first place. Um, and another way to do these well is that rebuttal extensions are often the most effective 
when a claim from your diagonal team has not been taken down sufficiently by your top half and if your diagonal team is winning the debate at a particular point. So if your top half team also like decimated the other opening bench, I think it's difficult to win running a rebuttal based extension because even if you provide additional damage to, to the material and the rebuttal is better, it will have less strategic weight in the minds of the judges because your top half already taken down that argument. So I just think that like, I mean, this fits more to the category of when to do it, but I think it's effective um, because you can the likelihood that you will at the very least beat your top half is higher just on the basis of doing a substantially better job with engagement. With rebuttal based extensions, it's also important not to just give an additional response relative to what top half said, but to give a better response, especially if you're going to like win the debate rather than just to take a second. So let's say that front half did a good job of mitigating an argument that came from the diagonal team. A way that you can have substantially better rebuttal is to flip the claim. And then and then to be like front half explained why it's not as impactful, but we're actually going to explain why the reverse is likely to take place. So it's about the quality of the rebuttal that you're giving if you want to do well with these extensions, rather than just providing an addi additional reasoning as to why a claim is not true. It's also very important within these extensions to weigh the value of rebuttal into the round. So Especially, and I think that framing rebuttal based extensions can be even more important than framing in the other categories that I discussed. Um, the reason being that rebuttal extensions are often just easily dismissed because the value of the contribution is just assumed to be lower than other arguments. So you need to weigh why taking down a premise from the diagonal team will massively, massively change the entire strategic interaction of, of the debate. And therefore, even if the contribution is not an argument, the role of your contribution was to tilt the weighing balance of the debate overall. So a couple of examples of useful rebuttal based extensions. Um, so there's like, so there was the motion at Docs Bridge 4 of this house prefers a world where people believe in determinism over one when, where people believe in free will. We were closing opposition. So how the top half clash unfolded is that opening government made the argument that it is bad if people blame themselves for their mistakes. Oh, I'll just paste the motion. So OG said it's bad if people blame themselves for their mistakes because that makes them feel sad and it's not good to feel like you are responsible for bad things that happen in your life because that's something that can be quite emotionally crippling. Opening government gave the response to this argument of like it is true that you can't that you won't take credit for bad things that happen to you anymore, but you also can't take credit for all of the happy things in your life. Like maybe you studied really hard, you got an A on your test, but now you're just going to be like it was like some deterministic being that led that to take place rather than actually feeling like you can take credit for your own accomplishments. So while this rebuttal was good and I think washing out the argument that came from opening government, I think it was like this particular kind of clash ended in a bit of a deadlock because it was unclear whether for the vast majority of people feeling sad um, about being responsible for failures in your own life or not being able to take credit from your own accomplishments is something that is more important for the emotional well-being of people. One of our contributions on closing opposition was to just weigh why people not being able to take credit for their accomplishments is far more emotionally crippling than people feeling like they are responsible for bad things in their lives. And the, the way that we tried to break that deadlock was by explaining natural psychological defense mechanisms that exist and that people have. So internally speaking, we, have, we often have a greater tendency to take credit for the happy things in our lives and to take credit for our own accomplishments because that brings us a sense of joy, whereas we already have natural defense mechanisms to deprioritize bad things that happen in our life that are outside of our own control by saying some other person in our life is responsible for causing a particular thing just because that makes us less happy, and then gave a couple intuition pumps about how psychology works. Even though the line of our response here was quite similar to the response that our opening half had already given of people cannot take credit for happy things anymore, the way that we weighed that value of, of the rebuttal was to frame um, why in top half it was unclear whether one mattered more, whereas we actually gave the psychological characterization about why in the majority of cases we care about X impact more. So always frame why your rebuttal is more important than, than the rebuttal that your top half already gave. I think another example of a successful rebuttal based extensions is just like the classic debate motion of you find out that the world is going to end, do you reveal this information to the majority of people as like a scientist or as someone who just happens upon this information. 
The way that the top half clash ultimately works is that opening governments, like you want to do good things, like spend your last happy living days with your family or going on vacation or living your dreams. And then opposition's like, but there's going to be massive anarchy and the world is going to collapse. Um, I think that a useful kind of rebuttal based extension that you can do on closing government is to give reasons as to why anarchy is either something that is preferable because you remove laws that inhibit people's agency under the status quo and just argue why anarchy is actually better. But more importantly, you can just give reasons as to why anarchy won't actually be that bad by characterizing why during times of trauma, we often turn to things like shared support networks and just give intuitions about why all of the massive harms of like riots are something that are unlikely. So even though what you're doing here is you're just mitigating the um, what you end up getting from opening opposition of there's going to be anarchy, I still think that this can be a maybe, well, maybe not like the best argument in the debate, it can still be winning material in the sense that you can say, look, in top half, opening government's goal was to unlock a greater quantity of choices for people. Opening opposition explained why in a world where there's anarchy, the choices that you make are going to be inhibited. The unique value of our extension is to break this deadlock and to explain why you will actually be able to unlock more choices for people on opening government by just proving the likelihood of absolute anarchy and of absolute rioting. So provided that you frame that contribution, I think this is just a good way to win on the basis of primarily having rebuttal. Cool, so the final group of, um, group of extensions that I wanna chat about are strategy-based extensions. So all extensions kind of do fold back into a baseline level of strategy. But what I mean by these extensions is that your primary function is not rebuttal, it's on impact, it's on a mechanism, but it's about kind of weighing or burden pushing, explaining a crucial trade-off that existed in the debate. So in terms of strategy extensions, I think there's kind of three main ones that I thought of. So firstly, your primary contribution is weighing and explaining a critical trade-off. Secondly, uh, this is what the debate is actually about kind of extension, which often will happen in regrets motions. And then thirdly, to find a way to prove that a top half team did not fulfill their burden and then to fill that gap on back half. So I'll go through each of these. In terms of one to run a strategy extension, I don't think that there's like a perfect time because I think that these can be quite effective. I think it's good if you feel stumped because top half took all of the arguments and you don't really know what to do, especially if the rebuttal is also very good. But I also think that a lot of the time these extensions are just quite an easy way to win as well. Um, in the sense that you just, like they're, they're often very critical to your path to victory. We kind of just prove um, why our team wins. So in terms of the different kinds of strategy-based extensions, so the first one being weighing and explaining a crucial trade-off. So what you're doing here is you're often taking premises that were present in top half in the debate that may have been proven and also may have been slightly impacting, but you're giving the fundamental weighing about why you should care about something more. So an example of where a weighing extension could be effective is, is in the motion, this house regrets the deregulation of the financial sector. This is like a short version of the motion, but I think where this was run was something about like after the 2008 financial crisis maybe, or maybe before then. I don't remember, not super important. So God will probably make the argument that the deregulation of the financial sector is bad because it has increased systematic risk within markets where you extended um, loans to people who were riskier, who were less likely to be able to pay back those loans, and then that was harmful. So the Gov case is primarily about risk. And then Ott makes the argument that deregulation is good because it led to credit being extended to a higher quantity of disprivileged groups. More people were able to get mortgages. That was then important in improving their, their own quality of life. So let's say that you are a closing government and you're like, Top half did a very good job of proving their arguments. It's clear that on one side you get more risk, it's clear that on the other side you get more credit. The critical portion of this debate is not what the trade-off is or what the arguments are, but rather it's about whether we care about risk or whether we care about people getting more credit. And then directly give weighing mechanisms about why risk is something that matters more. So if there's a, a more frequent financial crisis, this will often impact the groups the most who credit expansion aims to help in the sense that it's often poor workers who are laid off first. Um, the fact that it makes that increased risk makes the expansion of credit substantially more temporary because as soon as there's, there's a financial crisis, getting more credit doesn't matter if interest rates on your mortgage ultimately skyrocket and you end up losing your home. So it makes the reasons that we care about credit expansion in the first place a lot more temporary, but also just weighing about why higher numbers of people getting more credit matter substantially less than the very, very concentrated impacts to your quality of life on more financial crisis. So what you're doing here is you're just taking top half arguments and you're weighing 
why one claim matters more. Another econ example of this could be in the minimum wage debate. So one team just proved it's good if people have more money. The other team proved that there'll be more unemployment if they don't do a good job impacting those things, just actually weighing the direct trade off about why we care about a particular thing more than another thing. The second kind of strategy extension is to recenter the debate to what it is actually about, which is quite a vague heading. But what I mean by this is that let's say there's a regrets motion and both teams don't really regret the, the, the regrets component of it, just being like, this motion is actually about what happened throughout history. I'm actually going to engage with, with what the motion is. I think another way that this is really commonly done is in narrative debates where top path makes very, very ambitious arguments but they don't actually do the most fantastic job of explaining why the narrative applies in such a way where all of their impacts are true. So you could kind of step in and say things like Top Hat gave all of these arguments, but they don't actually link it back to the narrative in this debate. We think, we think that this narrative is far more subtle um, and it impacts only this particular group of people given the way that the narrative interacts with other conflicting social narratives. And therefore we're just gonna win on the basis of our extension being like substantially more realistic. So a couple examples of, I think, where this has happened quite effectively or where this can happen. So in terms of our regrets debate, um, let's say that there's a motion, this house regrets the norm of societal association between sex and romantic love. So in the debate that I was in, we were closing government. Um, open and government did a very, very good job of making the argument about how hookup culture is not associated with romantic love. And it's been very empowering for women. It's been very empowering for the LGBT plus community. Um, and this is all about hookup culture that doesn't have to deal with romantic love. And it's also good for sex workers. Um, we were closing government and the way that we outframed this material was by being like, the sexual revolution is status quo, even in a world where historically um, there was the association between sex and romantic love, but this is a regrets motion. So they can't just engage with in status quo, this might be good. We actually have to consider throughout history what this narrative would have impacted. And we just simply made the argument that birth control would have been invented substantially earlier within human history if there wasn't the norm that people should only procreate in the context of their marriages. And then just explain why that would have just been like massively more empowering for particular groups of people. And then made other arguments that appealed to history. So I think that these are like, I think that regrets debates are often the best chance to actually consider. Not only did teams realize it was a regrets motion because they often do, but in these debates, it's often did teams actually prove why they came for factual that they asserted in their case it's a likely one? So let's say that opening government's teams are contingent on a, a particular counterfactual. What you can often do on back half is you can give structural reasons why a counterfactual that your front half said is actually the likely one, especially if there was pushback to that that came from the other crossbench. Another example of like a what is the debate actually about extension in a narrative round is the motion, this house opposes the glorification of youth. So let's say that the opening half clash was a lot um, about, or sorry, this house opposes, I'm not sure I said regrets. So let's say that the opening half clash is a lot about ageism within politics. So do we prefer more political action that goes to building retirement homes and caring about pension systems or more political action that goes to funding universities and caring about that? I think that on back half, the way that you can just marginalize all of these arguments is by saying like, Politics is influenced by bajillion other things and narratives. People who have the political capital to care about pensions are gonna do that whether we have this narrative or whether we don't. This narrative only really applies to ways that individuals conceive the pathways of their own life. And it's only really internalized by individuals. And then you can just make the claim that the glorification of youth is bad because it makes people feel sad when they age. It leads to the over glorification of beauty and beauty norms in general. People feel like their life is on an arc of diminishing marginal returns and is moving to a dark end and you increase the probability of things like midlife crises. So while this is, is kind of similar to just like what I said earlier about running a new impact and then framing it, I think that in narrative debates in particular, you, you can often just really interrogate on back half, where does this narrative actually applies? Who is actually influenced by it? especially by running framing of other narratives that also exist under the status quo that interact with the narratives that the motion is directly about in order to marginalize ways that front half frame or characterize particular kinds of narratives. Um, the final kind of strategy extension is trying to prove that a top half team didn't actually fulfill their burden in the context of the debate, even if it appeared at that point like they were winning and the other team didn't call them out for, their, for not filling their burden. So an example of this is in the motion, which was one of the partial motions, I don't remember how to say it with the 
millions of brackets at Doxbridge, but the sus would only allow the media and campaigning organizations to depict or publish information about the deceased in a tragedy with the explicit permission of the family. Let's say you're a closing opposition. Opening opposition runs the arguments that with like the very obvious argument of we need to get gruesome photos to get a form of social change to expose the violent nature of gang violence in a particular community, or you need very, very gruesome photos in order to care about the plight of refugees. Opening government offers the mitigation to this argument, but not all families are going to veto the photos. So if your claim is that you need emotive photos to care about refugees, you can still get a large quantity of those. Why do you need every single family to allow these photos to enter into the public sphere? So in this case on CO, I think that the burden that opening opposition does not identify is why you need all photos to be released to the public and to be publicized rather than just 50% or, or a significant majority. And you can frame that opening opposition didn't fulfill their burden in that regard. And then you can make arguments that you need all photos to be released to the public because you never know which of the photos is going to go viral and actually resonate with people. So you never know which photo is going to be the next Alan Curdy, but also just characterizing why different people have different empathetic systems and therefore different people resonate with different photos. You never know who's going to be inspired by what. And therefore you want to maximize the opportunities that people will have to empathize with, with a particular issue. And therefore having a few photos that it will aim to get social change change is not something that is politically sufficient. So what you were doing here is you were exploring that top half made the argument, but they never actually fulfill their burden when making that particular argument. And then you can just step in to fill the gap about why you need all of the photos. I'm stealing this one from tech seminar, but I think it's a really useful way to illustrate the point of there was a debate at Euros a few years ago about whether feminist movements should adopt violent Hindu female goddesses as their symbols. Top half might do a good job of a debate about whether these symbols are good, but they never actually engage with the composition of the with the component of the motion that deals with the violence in particular and why you need violent symbols. And then you can just step in um, and, ex and do on, on back half explain why violent symbols are uniquely valuable way in actually galvanizing social change. So they might either miss a particular word in the motion that they need to defend or they just won't do a great job of burden fulfilling within the argument that they actually selected. So this is what I have for strategy extensions. So that marks the end of the content that I have prepped, but you're welcome to ask any questions you have about any material that was covered or other material about extension speeches in the chat or just to unmute yourself and ask as well. Yep. Yeah. Hi, am I audible? Yep, you are. Yeah, cool. So uh, for the extension speeches, I wanted to ask that, can a speaker add something new in the extension speech? And if he can, if he or she can, how? Like what do you mean add by something new to adding something new to his, uh, his or her prior arguments? Like if something I uh, spoke in the speeches and I wanted to speak more about it, maybe in the extension POIs or somewhere, can we do that? I'm a little bit confused about what you're asking. So is this if Top Path already made the argument, but you're trying to add something new to that? Yeah, 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 that, that, that. Yeah, yeah, so you absolutely can. Um, this would fall under the portion of the seminar that I gave about ways to extend by either adding a new mechanism, so giving an additional reason about why the argument is true, or adding a new impact to explain why the argument is important, or just a new way of weighing the material into the round. You definitely don't need to have an entirely like new and innovative concept every single time that you extend. So it's absolutely a viable strategy provided that you actually do the work either in the extension speech or the web speech to explain why the new thing that you're adding either beats your top half or is strategically important in some way. All right, thank you, thank you so much. No worries. I'll hang around for a few minutes to answer other questions. Um, you're also welcome if you have any questions that you don't want to ask me right now to just PM me on Facebook and I will respond. Okay. Um, so Okay, so I'll start responding to the direct message that I got and then I will answer Annika's question. 
Oh, it's a couple of direct messages. Okay, so the first one is, how do you normally weigh that your additional mechanism is more important if you're trying to reach similar impacts with your opening? So in terms of weighing an additional mechanism as mattering, um, the most helpful way that I, I find to be able to do this is to listen to how the other opening team responded to the mechanism. So even if like if you're OO, even if, sorry, if you were CO, even if OG didn't entirely crush opening opposition's mechanism, they probably did something to like throw shade on it or to mitigate it such that it's not 100% persuasive. So you can be like, the mechanism that was given by top half is already highly, highly mitigated. And I've explained why it's not going to be true in a lot of circumstances, whereas our mechanism is going to apply to a greater number of contexts. It is not vulnerable to the same rebuttal. Um, So I think that like using the rebuttal that the other opening half team gave to your opening bench and then weaponizing that against them. It's also a very useful way to like not knife your opening team or to sound like you're directly rebutting them. So that would be the strategy that I would recommend the most. You can also just throw things in there. Like they gave the tagline for why a reason is true, but never actually illustrated it whatsoever. And just like the, the stock wing line for mechanistic extensions of our mechanism applies to a greater number of contexts or greater number of people. So I'm only going to apply to this particular group of individuals who are motivated to act in a particular way, but it's a lot more like universally applicable and the number of people who the mechanism is going to influence. Um, if that was an unclear response, feel free to send a follow-up message. Okay, um, and then the other direct message was very similar. Oh wait, so like, I, Bob, I wasn't actually answering yours. I was um, answering Elias, but they're very similar um, questions. So your question is, to what extent can a new max steal an opening impact? I think this really depends on like how bad of a job your opening did mechanizing. If your opening have team did a good job of mechanizing the material, even if you add a new a good additional mechanism, probably not sufficient in stealing the opening impact, you could probably take a two. If opening half team did a very bad job and like none of the mechanisms stood at the end of top half, then you can do a very good job of stealing the impact as via a new mechanism. And it will also depend on the quality of your own mechanism, right? Like, especially given that top half will probably take the best and the most intuitive mechanisms. A lot of the strategic judgment call of the mechanistic extension is very contingent on how good and how persuasive is your new mechanism. So a lot of the time, I think it's just a strategic judgment call. Okay, Annika's question. Do you think there are differences in terms of how different regions credit extensions and what you should run from that? Oh, absolutely. Um, so like I debated in North America my first year and then I came to Europe and I was absolutely shocked at the differences in how backup teams are credited. I will caveat that for this answer. I've only debated in North America and Europe. I have not debated much on the Asian circuit, although I have heard that the Asian circuit judges extensions more similarly to Europe. So in North America, extensions are credited substantially more just by virtue of being new and or as being trivial. And there's a far smaller burden that is placed on closing teams to directly weigh their material relative to front half. And a lot of the time, I think that top half teams are actually punished if they just didn't think of material that the back half team ended up running. So the burden of proof for weighing in North America is substantially lower. Um, another thing about extending in North America is that analysis extensions are just credited a lot more. So if you just run like four new mechanisms for an argument, even if opening up, even if your opening mechanism, like one mechanism was slightly sufficient, you will often still be credited. So teams vertically extend in North America substantially more rather than running new material. Um, European judges in general, from my experience, are substantially more punitive on like back half teams, like rightfully so, in my opinion, which is that A, you actually have to frame why your material is more important. It will never just be taken as a given that just because you run something that's new and trivial, front half made a mistake by not running that material. And in fact, it often could just be assumed that front half made a strategic decision by only really emphasizing one or two arguments. But, um, and, and also like teams get called derivatives substantially more. So even if you're adding a couple more nuances and illustrations or new examples, there's a much higher burden on, on you to actually explain the relevance of the new material that you're adding. So yeah, so definitely one debating between different circuits, which I unfortunately cannot shed more light on. Um, definitely do like ask around how back half teams tend to be credited. And in Europe, make sure that you are not being derivative. You are explaining your new contributions. I recommend analysis extending less often, whereas in North America, you can get away with that stuff a lot more. Okay, are there any other questions? When, okay, so the additional question is, how do you deal when the other closing team introduces a new counterfactual that is different from opening? Should the judges give them credit? Um, this is a good question. And I think it's often something that the whip speaker will have to contend more with if you are 
on closing government and the other team is closing opposition. But if you are CEO, yes, you do need to engage with the new counterfactual. But once again, it really depends on what the motion is and ask yourself, is the new counterfactual that the other closing team is running legitimate? So if, if it's a regrets motion and the other team's like, actually the counterfactual would be X, especially if the opening team did not explain that, that's totally within the purview of the motion and you do have to engage with that. Um, I think that the best way to do that is often just to be quick on your feet and to think of responses. Um, also, if it's a regrets motion, which is I think the most like the most common reason that a new counterfactual is introduced by a back half team, you've hopefully allocated some time and prep to anticipate different counterfactuals that the other bench might run and therefore have some big idea about how to respond to that, even if it came too late into the round. Obviously, if it's like a rogue counterfactual where the team just knifes their opening and a motion where that would not be suitable, the judge should not give them credit. Still have a couple of responses because some judges can be a little bit rogue. And you also like always better to just have some level of engagement to just explain why it's a knife or why their counterfactual is incorrect. But I don't think that the way that you should respond to a counterfactual is like that much scarier than just responding to the introduction of the new argument by the other closing team. Okay, so it doesn't look like there's other questions unless I'm missing anything, in which case you can feel free to just unmute and ask. In that case, thank you very much for coming to the seminar. I hope it was helpful and feel free to once again ask me any follow up questions that you have.